How do you get super rich and make millions of dollars in real estate investing? This is the question everybody has, and hopefully today I can help you get that much closer to it. I've been on a journey myself for quite some time, and anything I can help you guys understand, even if one person gets something out of this, it's worth it for me. So a couple things. The biggest thing, honestly, in real estate investing is education. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be ready. You have to listen to podcasts, uh, read books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a great one. Million Dollar Real Estate Investor is another great one. Podcast, Bigger Pocket, Grant, Grant Cardone has some good ones. Um, Tony Robbins is more motivational. Uh, I would recommend those guys and also real life scenarios, right? So you have to be prepared for the situation when it comes up because if you're not, you're going to be 10 steps behind. I wish five years earlier I had the education when I lived in Nashville when it was booming. I could have got into something for like three and a quarter, 350. That would be worth uh, 1.5 today easily. And instead, I bought a piece of land out there. And unfortunately, you live and you learn. That one is not one of my best properties. But, you know, sooner or later, maybe I'll do something cool with that. Um, so the real strategy on how you do it, it's called the Burr Technique. B-R-R-R. So basically, it means buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. So first, how do you buy? Well, people, if you don't know how to buy, that like myself 15 years ago, you would think you didn't have the opportunity. But believe it or not, it's a lot easier than you think. You don't need nearly as much money either as you think. To get an FHA loan, you only need 3.5% down. But other people think, well, I might already have an FHA loan. FHA loan, you can have more than one of them. You just actually have to live in that property for a year. Or at least that has to be the design of the property. So when I learned this information, I already had a property, but I took a new job. And instead of selling the property, I decided, let me just get another one. And then I'll rent that one out when I leave. And that's exactly what I did. So if you have a home and you're looking at moving... I might have made 20, 30, 40 grand if I sold my one property that I had for a few years and moved. Instead, I kept it, I rent it, I still rent it to this day, and honestly, it's gone up probably 200 grand since I started that. So, and that's just passive income and it's long-term real wealth building that is accumulating and compounding. But we'll get into that a little bit later. So, um so learning how to buy and knowing how to buy. For me, what helped me a lot too was I linked up with a mortgage guy and I linked up early. You have to educate yourself well in advance. You can't just say I'm ready to buy and then talk to a mortgage guy and he'll be like, actually, you're not. You're six months out. You're a year out. Um, so for him and I, the first thing he said is, look, the credit score needs to be in a certain area. So why don't we work on the credit score now? So I spent six months repairing my credit score and actually I could have paid someone a few grand. I took out a book credit repair for dummies and I just read it and it was pretty simple call this company do this pay this pay that negotiate so you can negotiate some of that so obviously repairing your credit having good credit having an income is going to be essential into getting a house now you can obviously get a partner uh, you can be the silent guy and just doing all the moves and he can have his name on everything if you trust him that much and people like that as well um, if you don't want to just get a partner you can do the FHA if you've got tons of money and you're like, hey, I don't want to have a bigger bill. Although for me, the rental income is more important than the size of the bill every month because I'm outweighing that anyway. Um, or you can do a commercial loan, which is going to be 40 to 50% down, or you can just buy cash and you might get a better deal. And if you have the cash, why not? This isn't for someone who has no money necessarily, but this isn't for someone who has to be super wealthy. Every, every person with an income who has decent credit can can do this. Uh, and even without the income, you can work as a partner again. So now you're working with a mortgage person, you have the opportunity to buy something, you've got to negotiate, right? Um, look at something that's going to earn you money. For me, the strategy I look for is I look for at least three bedrooms if I'm buying a single family or if I'm buying a two family, I want at least two per side, if not three. The number of bedrooms is what's going to actually control how much you bring in. So you have to be looking at number of bedrooms. I like two families with three and three on each side. I mean, obviously that's a, a perfect scenario, but it doesn't have to be your perfect scenario. But if you have a single family, 
one of the first properties I bought was a single family with three bedrooms and I was able to charge an extra couple hundred dollars than if it was a two and I got it for the same price of two, actually probably a little bit less. And I actually went in with a partner on that one as well. So we both put some money down. I put it all in my name. Um, I had the credit and the income and, um, you know, we got it. We did some repairs. It was a lot less than I thought because we negotiated. We didn't settle. And I noticed it was on the market for, for quite some time. So um, getting into the property at the right price is what's going to put you on the right track to get a second and a third one as well. And we'll explain that later. That's part of the refinance part. Because if you buy it too high, it's going to take you two or three times as long to refinance. So you need to be able to refinance a lot sooner. Um, I just purchased a two family with three bedrooms on the one level and three on the other, which we were going to, which we actually did convert into a fourth. And I've got some footage for that, some real life footage. So I want to show you that right now of what we did to this house. Uh, it was on the market for 325. I offered 25,000 more for 350. Turns out the house appraised right around that. We put a ton of work into it, and now every month I'm cash flow flowing over $2,000 a month on top of my rent and everything on this property. Um, so check out this rehab video. I uh, won't give up my location as to where just yet, but uh, I think you'll enjoy this. And um, you can kind of see what we did to this property here and how we turned it into a cash flowing property. All right, I'm in my new property here in South Jersey. I'm not gonna give away the location because it's a gold mine town right now to be buying in. Uh, this house was listed as a six bedroom. It's a three bedroom and a three bedroom, two family. But the reason why I liked it so much is there was so much value here in this attic space that we're actually gonna convert it into an additional bedroom so we can have a four bedroom and a three bedroom. Um, we have all this living space right here that can be a nice little upstairs to an apartment but if you'll notice the walls are plaster there's some great artwork already on here so not a desirable area but the plaster is already flaking falling off off of the ceilings as well so we decided to get this wood paneling it's going to look like a log cabin feel so you can have fresh wood all over we're going to strip this floor down to the bare roots and refinish the floor and still kind of deciding on these baseboards if we want to rip them out. Probably will because we're going to come this far and redo it. Might as well have a nice fresh cabin feel all around. You have all this living space right outside here, but you also have an extra space that's perfect for a bedroom right inside here. And it needs some work, but this is going to look clean just like a cabin feel for only a few thousand dollars at the and the, what's really important is you gotta make sure there's a heater up in these spaces or else you can't rent it, can't pull a living space. We do have a heater here as well. So um, there'll be window air conditioned units in the summer, but um, I think we've got something we can turn into a bedroom here. baseboard down on the side of the walls here and whatever gaps we have in the floor, these big gaps, we'll just rip this down, fill in the gaps, and uh, yeah, that should do it. Same thickness, three quarters inch thick, and that's uh, that's what your floor's uh, thickness is, three quarters thick.
flat parts right here up to where it meets the ceiling. Like over there, those little flat parts. Just up to the ceiling parts. I got a little bit back there to do. I'm here in the back bedroom upstairs and initially we were going to put some the walls are pretty nice here, at least they were much nicer than the other ones. We're gonna try to just paint them and finish them, but the wallpaper is just crackling and pieces coming off. So instead, we're actually going with a shiplap finish. And what we did is we got quarter inch plywood and ended up cutting it in eight inch wide sections. And we're just sanding it, putting it on over the walls here, much more sturdy, um, gluing and nailing that in, and then we'll end up uh, painting this white probably or staining it. And uh, the upstairs will have a nice. Well, this is a caulking gun, liquid nail. It's a uh, heavy duty constructive uh, adhesive and pretty much glue and bond to anything. And a uh, little trick for getting up, you don't have a knife on you, you can stick the head of the caulk gun in this little hole, just like that. Clips the tip off. Then, on most caulk guns, it's got a little metal tip you can just poke. It'll open up the seal, put your glue in there. One day. Push it in. Now these boards, before I glue it, I like to knock the dust off. If there's any loose particles, sawdust, or wood dust, it'll uh, it can create an issue later on down the road. The same one I've used from the very beginning. So all my spaces are nice and even. And I put it in, push it up. Some people, some people use pennies or quarters. But I like to use this. Makes it nice and even. No worry. Just got the carpet put in on the upstairs here. You can see we've just painted some of the sides and the fresh carpet put in. We're putting the handrail in right now. Obviously, you don't want to fall off the side of the railing. So Timmy's uh, been building this one from scratch, stained it up. 
Timmy, what do we got going on here? Uh, I got your classic uh, handrail. You know, I went ahead and stained it before I put the uh, balusters in. That way, when we go back and do uh, next coat, it'll be a little bit easier. But yeah, just got this uh, done. Ready to do this one next. All right, we got the carpet upstairs all wrapped up. But come check it out. So we haven't really done a walkthrough in a while. We've got this room entirely completed in terms of the original board. Timmy was out here getting it all worked out. We still have to stain it. And then with these little holes right here, there's little holes all over. We're just gonna put some putty in each of those holes before we sand the walls and then stain it. And in this back room here, uh, we ended up ship lapping it. I was showing you guys a little bit, but we're not done, almost there. We're gonna get carpet in here. But um, we got two coats. We have one coat of primer and one coat of paint on here. Uh, just a traditional white. We're gonna get another coat of white tonight on here. And then uh, we're gonna get that gray carpet in. Probably need to build something around this uh, heater. We can't have that exposed. But other than that, this thing's gonna be run ready in um, you know, a couple weeks. We're gonna throw it on the market. After we finished the rehab, I was able to get it rented within a month, pretty much on each side. And I need a CO. We got the inspections. You get a concrete person, do the sidewalk repairs. Make sure you have good contractors that you trust and that can work with you on future jobs. Um, although I was new to this area I was investing in, I was able to get some good contractors and I've used them on at least three or four properties uh, since I've been doing that. And that really helps me a lot as well. You got to know um, and trust these people to come in and do the work because as much as you think in your mind they're going to when the work is there You actually have to get it done in order to get that CO So don't just buy something and you can't get a CO a CO is certificate of occupancy. You can't rent it without that So keep that in mind when you're looking for properties as well And another thing you want to consider is do all the inspections Make sure the foundation is solid. Make sure there's no leaking gas tank Don't buy a property where you're gonna have problems just because it's discounted Save a few more dollars. If you're putting 3.5% down for every 100000 that's $3,500. It's not a ton of money um, to get something that much better that you can sell later on. Don't consider like, oh, I'm never going to sell it. Always be thinking that if the time comes and you needed to make some money and sell to buy up or buy another property that you should consider doing that. Now that we've purchased the property and we've rehabbed it, now comes time to rent it. I got myself a real estate agent who I pay her one month and she get it say rented, make sure the credit check is good. I'm dealing with an eviction right now and it, we are five months into it and this person hasn't paid me in five months and it can go on for almost a year at this point in at least that county. So make sure the person coming can pay. Wait an extra month or two and don't just give up on price. Don't just come down and come down. Kind of hold a little bit. If you're not getting rented, maybe what you need to do is clean it up a little bit, you know, add a little something, put some paint somewhere, make it look that much more presentable, but be patient. Don't, don't wait, but don't buy in the wrong area. Make sure there's a city somewhat nearby, or at least an attraction, a train station, transportation, things like that people are going to be looking at. I want to get into a little more detail on the refinance. A refinance means someone is willing to buy your mortgage, whether it's a person or a company, and they're willing to get that interest rate and they're gonna buy it out from the person or company who currently holds your mortgage. You can also pay down or pay into one, but you can't just borrow against your property. You can't borrow any amount that you want as long as it's over the value. So the part of the Burr method, after the buy, after the rehab, now comes a time where there's another appraisal when you're ready to refinance. The rehab is what's going to increase the value. So let's just use an example. You say you paid two, three hundred thousand for a house. You put in, we don't need to put in 50K. I'm usually putting in 10 to 15 grand, mostly redoing the walls, maybe the floors, just something that's off the concrete, um, cleaning it up a little new carpets or some new paint, but just making it look uh, that much more new and that much nicer, right? Uh, so that when it does get reappraised, they're looking at the house and they're looking at all of those things. 
the appraised value is where you can borrow from. So no matter what one person buys it for, I could buy it for well over an appraised value. And if I buy a house over an appraised value, I actually have to make up the difference. So that's something else you need to keep in mind when you're buying a property. You can't offer way higher than the appraised value or else you have to actually pay all of that difference cash. They're only going to borrow or lend enough money to cover the appraised value. They won't cover extra. Now, they might see your income or something like that, and they might say, okay, I feel comfortable. I know this person, but that becomes uh, established after some time, so it won't happen right away. Um, so in terms of the refinance part, this is the part that allows you to go out and buy another property much sooner. We're not going to live for thousands of years, and this is probably why real sophisticated investors are like, man, I wish I had more time. I think we all say that, but that's why the earlier you can do this, the better, and the longer you can do it, the better. So, Or the quicker you can speed things up, like with the refinance. So once you've got it rented, as long as it appraises for a certain amount over, you can borrow 20% of that overage. So it's not a lot when you think about it. If it's over by 100 grand, the new appraisal, you can only borrow 20. But remember, well... You've already used an FHA, and you really can't just jump around FHA to FHA, you, FHA, unless you're going to live at each one. If you put one out there, and you stay at it, and you're fixing it up, and then you rent the one side, and you're ready to move to another one, you can then do another FHA loan, but you have to go and, and stay there. You can't do two FHA loans as well in the same year, at least from my understanding, so that's something else to consider, but you can do more than one FHA loan, and... If that $20,000 is enough to get you into the next house, you can just put the faucets on a little bit faster as well. So that's the plan. That's the goal. Buy the property, rehab it, rent it out, refinance it, get some more money, and repeat. And do it again and again and again. And you guys will thank me. Trust me. But I hope that I gave you a little bit of knowledge. And if you have more questions, definitely hit me up. I'd love to talk more. But again, real estate investing, anyone can get into it. And if you can refinance that property, what happens then is you go, you get your house appraised. You've done the work. You've increased the value. You bought it at a discount. So now what happens? That house has equity. You might have a few hundred thousand dollars of equity. You can borrow a piece of that equity. It's rented, so you're showing that you're making money coming back, so you don't have to show you're making more money at your regular job. And then you go, you use that money to put a down payment on the next one, you buy it at a discount, you fix it up, you rent it out, you go and you borrow money against that one, and you go get another. I know some people say, well, I keep borrowing, I can make money, and I can buy my own. Leverage as much as you possibly can get, because every property you're making money, not just on the monthly rent, you're building equity in the house. A lot of the properties I have are 30 to 50% more than when I originally bought them. So when you're borrowing against them now, you can borrow even more and then you can buy even more. And if you're earning at one property and you're earning two times over, it doesn't matter how much you're borrowing. Keep doing that over and over again. You're going to set the faucet down. It's going to go from a trickle to an absolute downpour. You guys will be rolling in no time. Be patient. This isn't something that happens overnight. But trust me, be patient, stick with it. Five, ten years down the road, you're going to look back and at least appreciate maybe you've watched this video. Mm -hmm.